The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. July 28th, 1914 marks the beginning of one of the world's deadliest global conflicts. World War I, or at the time known as the Great War, would take the lives of approximately 14 million people, 9 million soldiers, and 5 million civilians. And unfortunately, many would lose their lives in one place, the Western Front. Following the outbreak of war in August of 1914, the German army opened the Western Front by invading Luxembourg and Belgium, then gaining military control of important industrial regions in France. And both the German and French offensives were so strong that both sides literally entrenched themselves. Both sides dug long, meandering trenches that stretched from the North Sea all the way to the border of Switzerland. And between 1915 and 1917, there were several offenses along this front. Both sides utilized massive artillery bombardments, along with sporadic infantry advances that were supported with machine gun cover fire. This method of gaining territory in the Western Front was nearly Sisyphusian. Among the most costly of these offenses were the Battle of Verdun in 1916, where 700,000 soldiers died gaining zero territory. This number would be dwarfed in the same year during the Battle of the Somme, where more than a million soldiers died. However, during the Battle of the Somme, one soldier survived. His name was Percy Dell Smith, born in 1882. He arrived on the Western Front in late 1916, and he was a Royal Marines gunner. And during every artillery bombardment, Percy would be drawing. His sketches were of his surroundings, and even though he only used pencil and paper, he managed to depict the horrors of the Battle of the Somme. A common character would appear in many of his drawings, the Grim Reaper. This character would either be welcoming or denying the lost souls that would be on the battlefield. The images that stick out to me the most aren't his depictions of the death and violence during this battle, but the mundane, plain actions of soldiers within the trench. This image of soldiers walking with pickaxes really sticks out to me because it seems so aimless. It really makes you think about how these people felt. These people knew that the next day they could potentially lose their lives only to gain a foot of territory. This is Alicia Esteve Head, born July 3rd, 1973. She was born in Barcelona, Spain, and she came from a prominent family that was involved in a 1992 financial scandal for which her father and brother served prison terms. She would go on to attend the University of Barcelona and leave with a master's degree in business management. The skills that she learned at the University of Barcelona would come in handy. When interviewed, she said her master's degree in business management gave her the opportunity to work at the World Trade Center in 2001. Her role was a business management secretary, and on September 11th, 2001, Alicia Head claimed that she had been inside of the South Tower when United Airlines Flight 175 hit. She managed to survive by crawling through the smoke and flames on the 78th floor, all while sustaining severe burns to her arms. Her story resonated with many people, so she decided to join the World Trade Center Survivors Network and also managed to develop an online support group for 9-11 survivors. And within these support groups, her story was galvanizing. She would even go on to mention that her fiancé Dave was killed in the North Tower, and during her escape from the South Tower, a dying man gave her a wedding ring that was meant to be given to his wife. Alicia had received lots of press over this, and as a result, her story received a lot of scrutiny. In September of 2007, the New York Times sought to verify key details of Alicia Head's story as a part of an anniversary piece. You see, Alicia Head recently claimed that she received a degree from Harvard University and a graduate business degree from Stanford University, but both of these institutions had no record of her attending. 
She also claimed that she had been working at Merrill Lynch in the South Tower, but Merrill Lynch had no record of her employment, nor did Merrill Lynch have offices in the World Trade Center at the time of the attacks. As more news organizations requested interviews with Alicia Head, she would reject them or outright not show up at all. It would become very clear that her 9-11 survivor story wasn't true, and she told these false stories simply for attention. The New York Times would go on to contact other members of the Survivor Network in raising questions about the veracity of Alicia Head's story. And by the end of 2007, the Survivor Network refused any additional interviews with the New York Times and removed Alicia Head as president and director of the group. It's been over two decades since her lie has been exposed, and she's vanished from the public eye. The Independent made their own investigation trying to find out where she was, and they couldn't even verify her LinkedIn page. The aftermath of everyone finding out about her false story left many people hollow. Why would someone lie about being a part of such a traumatic event? Many people assumed it was for money and for fame, but she did all of this voluntarily. She never received a dime for her work with the Survivor Network, and she never received payment for any interview done with a major news organization. The only explanation left is that she did this simply for attention. Femicide is the act of killing a woman. And Mexico has the second highest rate of femicides within Latin America, with an average of 10.5 femicides committed every day. The states with the highest incidence of femicide are Veracruz, Nuevo León, Puebla, and Mexico City. Of these crimes, 3% are criminally investigated and 1% obtain convictions. This is Ingrid Escamilla Veragras. Born in 1995, she was 25 years old and originally from Puebla. And this is Eric Rosas, 46, who worked as a civil engineer. And they had been a couple for five years. And it's important to note that before Eric and Ingrid got together, Eric was married. And the reason why he was no longer married is because his ex-wife divorced him over domestic abuse. And unfortunately, Eric would go on to abuse Ingrid. And unfortunately, this abuse would escalate on February 10th, 2020. The crime against Ingrid Escamilla occurred after an argument in which Eric Rosas went into a rage when questioned for drinking alcohol, which triggered a fight in which he received several slashes from Ingrid. Eric would then go on to stab Ingrid in the neck multiple times, killing her, then removed her skin and various organs in which he tried to flush down the toilet of his house. He didn't succeed in doing so, so he collected all of her organs, placed it into a green bag, and then discarded it onto the street. Eric's son, from his previous marriage, witnessed the entire murder and called his mother. And after hearing about this gruesome murder from her son, Eric's ex-wife called the police. The police would arrive at Eric's home and find Ingrid's body in the bathroom. Many crime scene photos would be taken and Eric would be immediately arrested and would confess to the crime. And many would think this is where the story would end, but unfortunately, things would get worse. Somehow, popular tabloid newspapers in Mexico City received the gruesome crime scene photos and placed them on the front page of these newspapers. The articles written about this murder were sensationalist and it made people upset. It seemed like no one cared that Ingrid Escamilla was a living person who was gruesomely murdered. These newspapers turned this woman's worst moments into entertainment. It also didn't help that the very same videos and images of her body and organs were shared on Twitter and Facebook as well. The mayor of Mexico City, Claudia Scheinbaum, announced that the dissemination of the images would be sanctioned. Therefore, an internal investigation on six public servants who may have leaked the photographs of Escamilla was opened. The prosecutor of Mexico City, Ernesto Ramos, supported Scheinbaum and described the leak as an offense not only to the victim and her family, but an offense to society. This is Carol Lombard, born October 6, 1908. She was an American actress, particularly noted for her energetic and often offbeat roles in screwball comedies, and is ranked 23rd on the list of greatest female stars of classic Hollywood cinema. Carol Lombard was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana to a very wealthy family. 
Though her parents were separated, it didn't necessarily affect her lifestyle, and the influence that her father and mother had led to her having an easy time entering Hollywood. The first ever film that she appeared in was called A Perfect Crime that debuted in 1921. She was 12 years old when she played the lead role. Even though she had an easy time entering the film industry, her first movie didn't do too well. And between the ages of 12 and 16, Carol Lombard didn't see a lot of success. It wouldn't be until 1927 when she finally had her break. She began appearing in slapstick comedies. She had a serious talent for comedy, and she saw a lot of success in that space. And that talent and success led her to getting her first serious contract with Paramount, where she was getting paid $3,500 per week for the movies that she would appear in, most of those films being screwball comedies, which was a subgenre of romantic movies that were more comedic. Most of her successful screwball comedies came out between the years of 1934 and 1935. She would continue to appear in a lot of films, but by 1941, her fame began to wane. And by this point, she'd earn enough money where she didn't necessarily need to appear in a ton of films especially because during this time, she found a lot of joy raising war bonds for the war effort. And by the end of 1941, Carol Lombard managed to raise $2 million in defense bonds in one single evening. And that day, her party had initially been scheduled to return to Los Angeles by train, but Lombard was eager to reach home more quickly and wanted to travel by air. Although her mother and her press agent were afraid of flying and insisted that the group follow the original travel plans, Lombard suggested that they flip a coin, they agreed, and Lombard won the toss. Unfortunately though, the group would regret that decision. In the early morning hours of January 16, 1942, Lombard, her mother, and her press agent boarded a transcontinental and Western Air Douglas DST aircraft to return to California. After refueling in Las Vegas, TW-8 Flight 3 took off at 7.07 p.m. and crashed into Potosi Mountain. All 22 aboard, including Lombard, her mother, and 15 U.S. Army soldiers were killed instantly. Lombard was 33 years old. The cause of the crash was attributed to the flight crew's inability to properly navigate over the mountains surrounding Las Vegas. As a precaution against the possibility of enemy Japanese bomber aircraft coming into American airspace from the Pacific, safety beacons normally used to direct night flights had been turned off leaving the pilot and crew of the TWA flight without visual warnings of the mountains in their flight path. And to this day, some of the aircraft wreckage remains on Potosi Mountain, although it's very difficult to find due to the slope and brush. This is Donna Ferrado. Born in 1949, she is a photojournalist and activist known for her coverage of domestic violence and her documentation of the New York City neighborhood of Tribeca. Most of her photojournalism before moving to the United States was based in Paris. She would be hired to photograph elites and wealthy couples, and in the mid-80s, after witnessing the husband of one of those couples brutally beat his wife, Ferrado embarked on an independent documentation of domestic violence in the United States. She spent several years visiting women's shelters, emergency rooms, and prisons, and traveling with the police to make contact with people who were involved in domestic violence. The set of photos that she took that covered domestic violence was titled Living with the Enemy. Living with the Enemy is about the dark side of family life. Domestic violence did not threaten my childhood nor did it intrude into my world until 1981, when, on assignment for a magazine, I saw a man hit his wife. I was unprepared for his violence. It shattered the belief I'd been raised with that home is a refuge from the chaos of life. That experience changed my life as a photographer. Until then, I'd been trying to show the beauty of people in love. Shocked that love could go so wrong, I became obsessed with documenting domestic violence. Driven to try to do something about it, I found that a camera was my best weapon. Much of living with the enemy was born out of frustration, first because I felt powerless in the face of violence I had seen, and second because for a long time no magazine would publish the pictures. It was only when I received the Eugene Smith Award in 1986 that magazine editors began to take the project seriously. I felt that it was important to find ways to show as many aspects of the problem as I could, because this problem has been concealed from the public view for too long. There's over two dozen photos that Donna Ferrado took for living with the enemy. Each photo comes with a short description and the date that it was taken. I picked out nine that stuck out the most to me. Diana in a hospital. When Diana was rushed to the emergency room, her chest was covered with black tire marks. Her boyfriend had driven over her with his truck. Still in the hospital two days later, 
She saw her injuries for the first time and said quietly, Well, I guess I don't look too bad. Diamond. As police arrested his father, Diamond said, I hate you for hitting my mother. Don't come back to this house. Janice. When she thought she escaped violence, Janice witnessed the murder of her friend Kim, whose husband killed her at the bus stop. Karen. He fights all the time, but it was never this bad before. Karen sobbed as her boyfriend was arrested. Her children had been awakened when the boyfriend threw Karen against the bathtub, knocking her unconscious. Later, Karen told a battered woman's advocate in the hospital emergency room that she didn't want to press charges. The boyfriend was released from the jail the following morning. First safe night. Mother and son slept peacefully after arriving at the women's abuse shelter. Amend, men's group. Bill cried as he admitted to the group that beating his wife when his son was watching reminded him of his own father. In front of his therapy group, Bill wept because he recognized there was little difference between the man that he'd become and the man that he dreaded as a young boy. Banked and Elizabeth. Banked ransacked the bathroom searching for his cocaine pipe. I've hidden it, Elizabeth said, to save our marriage. You're lying. You wanted it for yourself, Banked shouted. And suddenly he hit Elizabeth. Rita, the original unbeatable woman. Rita divorced her husband in spite of the family and social pressure to stay with him, as he was the father of her two sons. She told her mother, My sons don't recognize me now because of what he's done to me. I'll never go back. Jason defends his mother. Young Jason never goes to bed unarmed. Grabbing his plastic gun and rubber knife, he tells his mother, If daddy comes, I'll be able to stop him. This is Audrey Mestre, born August 11th, 1974, and she's a professional freediver. Born in Paris, Audrey knew nothing but scuba diving. Her family were enthusiasts. She began swimming when she was a baby and became a seasoned scuba diver by the age of 13, but didn't get full certification until her 16th birthday. In her late teens, her family would move to Mexico City and she would become fluent in Spanish, and she would eventually study to become a marine biologist in the University of La Paz in Mexico. In 1996, her interest in underwater sports led her to meeting a free diver named Francisco Pippin. They would develop a romantic relationship and move to Miami, Florida to live permanently. There, she would take up serious free diving with her husband, and after serious training, she would break the female world record by diving a depth of 125 meters or 410 feet. But that record wouldn't stay for long. A year later, she would break her own record by descending 130 meters or 427 feet. A few years would pass before she would attempt to break her record again. On October 4th, 2002, with a dive team under her husband's supervision, she made a practice dive off of Bahabe Beach in the Dominican Republic to a record depth of 166 meters, or 545 feet. After more deep dive practices, on October 12th, she prepared to attempt a dive to 171 meters. On reaching 171 meters, she opened up the valve on her air tank to inflate a lift bag, which would raise her up rapidly to the surface, but the cylinder had no air in it. A rescue diver arrived and inflated the lift bag with his air supply, but the bag did not rise fast enough due to the insufficient inflation, a strong current, and the riser rope being non-vertical. A dive that should have been no more than three minutes resulted in her being underwater for more than eight and a half minutes. By the time her husband put on scuba gear and dived down to bring her unconscious body to the surface, it was too late, and she was pronounced dead at the hospital on the shore. This is Dalton Prigine, born December 10th, 1959. He was the second of four children, and when he was two weeks old, his parents sent him from their home in Lafayette to live with his aunt and uncle in Houston, Texas. It wouldn't be until the age of 11 that he actually found out that his aunt and uncle weren't his parents, and that his actual parents had abandoned him. And around the time he found out that his aunt and uncle weren't his true mother and father, he began showing behavioral issues. And these issues were so severe that his aunt and uncle gave him back to his mother. During his preteen and teenage years, he would skip school. And in late March 1972, he was committed to the Louisiana Training Institute for Truancy at the instance of his mother. Released only seven months later, he soon came into conflict with authorities on charges of burglary, theft, and false firearms. In March 1974, he was committed to the Lafayette Juvenile Youth Authority and a residential program for delinquents. After a month, he would run away from the facility, and upon his return, his commitment was terminated and he was released on probation to his mother. 
In June 1974, Dalton was arrested for the killing of John Doucette, a taxi driver. Dalton admitted to the killing and was committed once again to the Louisiana Training Institute. In a later statement about the incident, Dalton stated that he and two friends called a cab with the intention of robbing the driver. One of his companions was carrying a gun. The three directed the driver to a quiet part of town and persuaded him to stop while they searched for an address. Dalton insisted on taking the gun from his companion because the other youth appeared to be nervous. Dalton approached the driver and believing that the driver was reaching for a gun of his own, fired twice and began running. While fleeing, he told a passerby to call an ambulance because someone had been shot. Dalton later turned himself into the police and admitted that he had killed the driver. During his time served at the training institute, a psychological evaluation was done, and he would be found to be intellectually limited and have very poor judgment, so much so that he was found to be a definite danger to himself and others, and it was very likely that in the future he would be killed. The juvenile courts had jurisdiction over him until he was 21. The doctor's recommendation was to keep him locked up until at least 1980, but he would be released in 1976. Three years would pass until he would eventually commit his worst crime. On July 2nd, 1977, Dalton Pergine and his three brothers left Rogers Nightclub in Lafayette. The four had spent the night drinking in various lounges in the vicinity, and they would proceed to drive around in their 1966 Chevrolet with the intention of going home. It was 5 a.m. The car's taillights weren't working, and within a few hundred feet of the lounge, Trooper Cleveland, who was driving his police vehicle to work, signaled the Chevrolet to stop. Dalton switched places with his brother in the front seat because he didn't have a driver's license. The trooper noticed the switch and ordered the occupants out of the car. He then told Dalton's brothers, Michael George and Michael Brizard, to stay in the car while he searched Joseph Pergine, the third brother. At this point, Dalton Pergine was also still in the car and was becoming more and more angry over the way that the trooper was searching his brother. That's when he reached down under his seat and took out a 38 caliber revolver got out of the car, approached the officer with the gun hidden against his leg, and as he neared the trooper, he fired without warning. Trooper Cleveland was then struck by two bullets and was killed. Dalton and his three brothers then fled the scene, but then were apprehended several hours later. They were immediately charged with murder and then given psychological tests. Dalton Pergine's mental aptitude was tested, and it was found that he had a verbal IQ of 82 and a performance IQ of 72, with his overall average IQ being 76, which meant at the time he was diagnosed with borderline mental retardation. This would pose an issue for his conviction. The judge sought the death penalty, but because Dalton Pergine had an incredibly below average IQ, it could be argued that he wasn't responsible for his own actions. But after the argument was made, the judge still decided to execute Dalton Pergine on May 18, 1990, by the electric chair at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. And this image was taken right before the execution. It's Dalton Pergine with his son. And this image is eerie in particular because his son, at the age of 17, would be sent to the very same prison his father was executed at for 60 years for killing his 14-month-old baby in 2001. This is Trayvon Hayes Miller, and he's 20 years old. He is charged with first-degree murder and is facing 50 years in prison. Let me tell you why. In June 2020, Trayvon Miller was in a relationship with Brayla Stone, a trans girl who was 17 years old. For a long time, the relationship was secret. Trayvon was afraid that if people were to find out that he was in a sexual relationship with a trans woman, people would think that he was gay. And three weeks after Brayla Stone turned 17, friends of Trayvon found out that he was dating a trans girl. Apparently, the way that they found out is that Brayla Stone was telling people that they were together. Apparently, Trayvon had been paying Brayla Stone in order to keep their secret. Brayla Stone no longer wanted to participate in that deal, and she threatened to expose Trayvon by telling others that they were together. And in that moment, Trayvon decided to do the worst. He would call and lure Brayla Stone to an area where they would frequently have sex, and he shot her, leaving her body upside down in the front passenger seat of the car. Brayla Stone's body would be quickly found, and the murder would be linked back to Trayvon because he shared his plan to murder Brayla Stone with his cousin. Following her death, local LGBT advocates in central Arkansas held vigils in Stone's memory. The Center for Artistic Revolution, a youth-focused organization based in Little Rock, called Stone someone who always held space for others to be themselves and express their identities, and invited mourners to honor her by wearing her favorite colors, red and purple.
This is Gordon Stewart Northcott. He was born in Bladsworth, Saskatchewan, Canada, and raised in British Columbia. He would move to Los Angeles, California with his parents in 1924. And two years later, at the age of 19, Northcott asked his father to purchase a plot of land in the community of Wineville. That plot of land would become a chicken farm, and over a course of two years, it would become one of the most infamous chicken farms in the area. Once the chicken coops were built, his 11-year-old nephew, Stanford Clark, would be sent to the farm to help Gordon. And over the course of a few years, Gordon Northcott would physically and sexually abuse his 11-year-old nephew. In August of 1928, out of concern for his welfare, Clark's 19-year-old sister, Jessie, visited him in the Wineville Ranch. At that time, Clark told her that he feared for his life. And one night, while Northcott was asleep, Jessie learned from Clark that Northcott had murdered four boys at his ranch. And once she returned to Canada a week later, Jesse would inform an American council of Northcott's crimes. The LAPD would quickly become involved, and because there was initially some concern over an immigration issue, the LAPD contacted the U.S. State's Immigration Service to determine the facts relating to the complaint, because Northcott was not really a citizen. On August 31st, 1928, Immigration Service inspectors Hudson F. Shaw and George W. Sklorn visited the ranch. Northcott, having seen the Asia driving up the long road to his ranch, fled into the tree line at the edge of the property, telling Clark to stall them and threatening to shoot him from the tree line with a rifle if he didn't comply. And for the next two hours, Clark stalled the inspectors. And finally, when Clark felt the agents could protect him, he told them that Northcott had fled. It wouldn't be until September 19th, 1928, when Northcott and his mother would be found in Canada hiding from the police. His nephew would go on to testify against him in court, noting all of the abuse done to him and also testifying that three young boys were killed on the ranch. One young boy in particular named Alvin Gothia was molested and then decapitated by Northcott. And once that was done, Clark was forced to dispose of the head and body by crushing the skull and burning the corpse. But because Clark was an 11 year old boy, he couldn't get the job done. So he ended up partially burning the body and disposing it on the side of the road. For the other two bodies that he was forced to dispose of, he used quicklime to dissolve the bodies. While in jail, Gordon Northcott's entire property was searched, and authorities found three shallow graves at the ranch where Clark had stated they were. These graves did not contain complete bodies, but only body parts. Clark and his sister Jessie testified that Gordon Northcott and his mother had exhumed the bodies on the evening of August 4th, a few weeks before Clark was taken into protective custody. They had taken the bodies to a deserted area where they were most likely burned in the night. The complete bodies were never recovered. After a lengthy trial, Gordon Northcott was found guilty of the murder of three young boys and would be sentenced to death on February 13th, 1929. What's up everyone, it's your boy Aileris aka Panda Daddy and I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, let me know in the comments down below and leave a like if you liked the video. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe fam, what you doing watching videos and not subscribing. And for old, make sure you hit that bell so you get these notifications every time. What better way to start May than with a channel favorite like Morbid Reality. So seriously, if you guys want more content like this, let me know in the comments down below. And I wouldn't be able to make content like this without my Patreon supporters, so a big thank you to Tron Destroy. 23, The Eggs One, Soviet Frog 69, Fitz Chivalry, Den Corda, Code Connor Purvis, Aileris' Mom, Declan, S16, Green Pasta Man, Squish, Rinhex, Mr. Bean, My Golden Experience, James Tucker, Lucas Adams, BMX30, Cinnamon Sticks, Scott, The Fake Musician, Buckethead, Samantha Bellhart, Admin Fanneker, Zacheth, Bloody Hunter, Keeley, Dunder Nass Hawk, Lady Laughs A Lot, Swiss Patreon user, Noah, and Catherine Taylor. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one of my merch store and one of my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.